Brian Brazil, uh, he's the founder of Robo's Perception, a Prometheus core developer, and most well known for proving that PromQL is Turing complete. And he's going to tell you about staleness in Prometheus 2.0. So, uh, so I presume you will kind of know who I am by now. Uh, you know, I, I may have done some inadvisable things with PromQL in my time. Uh, but what I want to talk about here is that you already had from Fabian the awesome changes that are happening in Prometheus 2.0 with the storage engine, uh, which is the biggest change. So I'm going to talk about the second biggest change, uh, which is a semantic change, uh, which also conveniently is one of the things for pull wins over push. So sorry, Gutem, your startup just can't handle this. <laughs> Uh, so this is a bug. This is a feature we've talked about for a long time. Like I filed a bug in July 2014, which is basically three years ago, soon after I got involved in Prometheus, most likely. Uh, so we're going to look at basically what Prome previous Prometheus versions did with staleness, and uh, the problems with that, and basically how I fixed it, or, or improved it. So the thing is, before 2.0, like anywhere up to, well, Prometheus 181 would probably be the last one. Uh, if you evaluate a range vector, like looking at a counter for 10 minutes, uh, it's always going to return all data points in that range inclusive. Nice, simple, not going to change. Great. If you evaluate an instance vector like a gauge, right, it'll return the latest value before the evaluation time, looking back to five minutes. Which is to say that if a time series gets no updated data points for five minutes, it goes stale and is no longer returned for instant vectors. Now, there is a flag you can use to control this setting. You shouldn't change it because most people have asked about this flag. We're trying to do event logging. And if you're going to do that, well, you can use InfluxDB or the Elk stack or something else, which is better designed for that use case. So there are several problems that come from the old stainless semantics. The first uh, one people come across most common is that if you have an alert on up equals zero, uh, and you can imagine you have something running on Kubernetes, it starts failing, it has up equals zero at least once, and then it's rescheduled. That up equals zero is still there, and will be there for five minutes, even though it's being rescheduled somewhere else and is now happy. So if you have created a hair trigger alert that's going to fire before like five minutes, against recommendations of Julius earlier, then yeah, that's going to just spam you with an alert which is uninteresting because Kubernetes has already rescheduled it, which is not particularly useful. And uh, you know, you should increase your fork laws because that's a good idea anyway, but it is something that users do run into reasonably often. Another issue you run into is sometimes series. Uh, this is a series which is sometimes exposed on a page, sometimes not, sometimes has about labels, may have happened in a certain lightning talk yesterday. Uh, but the thing is, if you can imagine you have a metric, and some scrapes it has a label foo, some it has bar. If I evaluate that metric, I'm going to see both, because they're both inside the last five minutes. Even though only one of those came in each scrape. So, you know, this is not something you should be doing, but there are some advanced use cases, aside from pretty pictures, where this is actually something you want to have. Uh, another one is related to these is double counting. So you can imagine if you go back to the example that you have your process, it dies, is rescheduled, and we're still seeing both because the rescheduling happened in the last five minutes. So we're going to double count that as two or three or whatever. Uh, so the total is going to be basically how many targets have existed over the last five minutes rather than how many targets exist now, which is what you actually want. And okay, up is it's generally okay because things don't turn that fast, but something like memory usage. You know, you're going to get all sorts of weird artifacts there, which is not what you want. Uh, another thing that is a common problem is that there is a practical limit on how long your scrape interval and your evaluation interval can be. If we're ever, only ever looking back five minutes, if you have a scrape interval of 10 minutes, half the time it's going to show nothing, which is not exactly useful. And in practice, the limit's even lower because you always must be tolerant to a failed scrape or a failed evaluation because it just takes too long or something. Uh, so that's kind of bad because it means the scrape interval can mostly be two minutes. Like Prometheus can deal with the load, 
but uh, you know the thing on the other end might be able to, such as certain slower network devices. And you could bump you know stillness delta, but you know that does have performance implications. And as I said, people trying to do this are normally trying to do event logging. Don't touch that setting. Another issue we have is the push gateway and timestamps. Because the push gateway, the data is exposed always as now, whatever now is when the scrape happens, rather than the time that the push occurred. It would be pretty handy if we could actually have that data appear with the timestamp of when the push occurred. Uh, because then we could see how recent it was, we could do analysis on it, and still have show up in the instant queries. We could sub across it, like, hey, this did this many records, this did this many records, sum over time it, great, that's the total. Um, so that's kind of handy, but that's not what happens. Instead, we get the same data multiple times, and you have to somehow tell that these are from different pushes. So this isn't great. This causes problems. Let's do better. So what are the things we want to have? The first is when the target goes away, like service discovery no longer returns it, or relabeling you know, just decides enough's enough, that it goes stale, we stop seeing its time series in instant queries. Uh, similarly, if a target just starts stops in a scrape showing a time series, we want it to go stale. We would be nice to be able to expose time series back in time for the push gateway. And we also would like to support longer scrape and eval intervals, because they do come up, even if most of you are using 10 seconds. Uh, so the implementation, it kind of seems simple in principle. Uh, when the target or the time series goes away, we'll ingest a special marker value saying, hey, I'm stale. Then, when we are, are evaluating an instant vector, if we see that's the most recent value, we'll discard that time series, because it's stale. And for range vectors, we'll just ignore those values, filter them out, pass them on to rate as usual. Nice, simple, elegant, right? Yeah. There's a reason this is an hour-long talk. So, <laughs> uh, so we, we need to have a special value that we can inject. Um, and you know, a lot of people say use NANs. Problem is Prometheus supports NANs, one of the few systems that does. We split full 64. But it turns out that uh, there's more than one way you can actually write NAN in uh, floating point numbers. And a NAN is defined as the exponent is all one, the fraction is non-zero. Uh, if it's zero, it's one of the infinities. So in fact, there's 2 to the 52 minus 1, or maybe 2 to the 53 minus 1, with the sign bit ways you can represent NAN. And considering Prometheus only supports one NAN, we just choose one of those arbitrarily as a real NAN, and we can use the other 2 to the 52 values for fun stuff. So obviously, we, as the real NAN, we happen to choose the value Go uses, uh, and then we just choose a special marker. The other thing, though, is NAN is special, standing for not a number. It's what you normally get if you just divide 1 by 0, at least with floating point. If you try that with an integer, you're going to get a processor exception. Traps are fun. Uh, so the other thing is that NAN is basically an error state in floating point, and it has a special property that NAN is not equal to NAN, which is how you filter them. But it also means that if you try to do floating point math with these, it will not work. Uh, so any comparisons to see if this is a real NAN or one of these stale markers, we need to do it at a bit level, not at the floating point level. Uh, so the good news is that Golang has functions called uh, float64 bits, which converts a 64-bit float into a 64-bit integer, and then we can just compare those directly. And there's a utility function I added for that. When I started out, the TSDB, which like the previous talks covered, uh, it was actually doing some floating point comparisons rather than bitwise comparisons, so I needed to, to change that, so they're actually all bitwise. Uh, some of the logic about being append only in terms of time was doing those sort of checks, so I had to fix that. That was the only change I needed to make in the TSDB. Aside from that you know, cleanliness change, this feature lives entirely in Prometheus itself. So it's completely doesn't touch the TSDB at all. It's kind of neat. I should also point out there's actually two types of NANs. There's quiet NANs and signaling NANs, uh, depending on whether signal error states or whatnot. I think I chose a signaling NAN for the stale marker. Or did I move it around so we have future expansion? It doesn't matter. There's a special bit representation. Um, so the simple case, the simplest case it turns out, is the case that also happens very rarely. And that is the case that I scrape a target, it has a time series. I scrape it again, it doesn't have that time series. So what we do is we just remember what we scraped in the previous scrape, we see if anything isn't there anymore, and then just add in a stale marker as we're ingesting it. 
nice and simple. It means we have to remember everything we scraped last time, but that's not too difficult to do given the optimizations we have around add fast and like the tree caches we have inside the new scrape loop for 2.0. So this is actually nice and easy for the least common case. Yay. And what's more complicated is like scrape failing is actually pretty much the same because we need to mark everything that failed, in the, everything that was in the previous scrape as stale. Uh, otherwise, a target could go down and then disappear, and we just keep on persisting that, which is not what we want to do. We want things to go stale if up is zero. So we just use the exact same logic as for a single time series and say, okay, take everything in the previous scrape, mark it stale. So it'll be like a gap there. And if there's more failures after that, well, the previous scrape was empty because it failed, so we don't have to do anything. So that's nice and cheap. Everyone good so far? These are the easy ones. <laughs> Target goes away, part one. <laughs> yes, this is not the easy one. I think this goes up to four or five. Uh, so, service discovery, target no longer exists. It goes stale, we just ingest stale markers for everything we scraped previously, and as well as for up and friends. Because uh, there's up, scrape duration seconds, scrape sample scrapes, and save sample scrape post relabeling. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get that name shorter. Uh, so, but it's of course not that simple. The first question you have to ask is, what timestamp should we have on these stale markers? Okay, so the thing is that scrapes, the timestamp that's used for scrapes is always when the scrape starts. And because of how Go works internally, that normally ends up being exactly the scrape interval, which is great for compression. Uh, so really what we want to use for these stale markers is when the next scrape was going to happen and use that timestamp. And that's fine as long as the next scrape doesn't happen. Because the problem is that service discovery could decide, hey, this target doesn't exist. Oh, wait, wait a second, it's there now. And if we've ingested these stale markers in the future, when the next scrape is going to happen, well, we can't change our minds because the time series database is append only. So that's kind of annoying because we'd break the next scrape just because, you know, it's flat. Now, we could try and detect this and keep continuity within a scrape job uh, to make that working, uh, but in actuality, that's kind of tricky, like pretty complicated, and also, in principle, the target could move from one scrape config to another scrape config if someone was doing a refactoring or something, and that would also kind of suck. So that uh, doesn't work either. So take the standard approach. What is the stupidest thing that would work? The dumbest solution ever that has the right semantics. So what we do now is a target is stopped, so previously, uh, service discovery makes target stop, and that's the same as being shut down. Uh, disentangle that. Uh, so if it stopped, okay, we stop scraping, but we don't completely stop the target. We just kind of sleep for a bit. We sleep until the next scrape would have happened, and its data would have been ingested at a safety buffer, and then we ingest stale markers. So basically, after the target is stopped, uh, we basically sleep for a while and try to ingest stale markers. And we delay this enough such that the scrape actually happens. Well, when we try to ingest the scale markers, it'll fail because, well, the database is append only and will catch that. And if it has gone away, then well, we've ingested the stale markers. Wonderful. So the general idea is we stop the target, we sleep for basically two scrape intervals, and then try to ingest the stale markers with the timestamp they would have had. It's dumb, but it works. So let's take a worked example here to try and see how this goes. So we have a target that we're scraping every 10 seconds, you know, on the 10 seconds. And we're gonna say at t equals 25, the target is removed. So the next scrape would have been at t equals 30. And conceivably, like if the scrape timeout was 10 seconds or it's slow or ingestion or so, it could have taken up to t equals 40 for that data to get into the database. Okay, if we were very at the edge. So we add some slack onto that. So the rate function uses 10% slack, so I said, sure, let's just follow that, because why not? So at t equals 41, we want to ingest stale markers with a timestamp of t equals 30, and then we actually make the target go away. So the answer is that basically one scrape later than would have happened, we get these stale markers in, which is far better than five minutes. Like in this case, we're basically 10, 20 seconds later, which is much better than 300. And then we come to another case, which is timestamps back in time. This is largely the push gateway. Uh, there's some other cases as well, like Graphite or the Influx of the exporter. Uh, Collecti has it as well. 
Uh, so, for range vectors, how to deal with time steps back in time? Well, we just ingest them as normal. Grand, no problem. And for the instant vectors, well, we'd like to keep on returning this old value, even though it might be old, old, as long as the push gateway is still exposing that in every scrape. Great. But let's consider a worst case here. At t equals 5, the push gateway says, yep, I have a scrape for t equals 1. Like four seconds ago, I got it. So, uh, you know, we kind of have instant vectors. So you saw the interface that Guten was showing, the courier interface, where you had a min t and a max t. So you kind of have to choose how far you're looking over. So we have to choose some amount of time to look back, because we can't look up over forever, because that could get very expensive. And you don't want to search back in time either, as that's an inefficient way to use the database. So what we could do is have a special sort of like live marker, like the stale marker, and use all those other bits, you know, that 2 to the 52 values. We could like put a timestamp in there telling us where to look. We'd actually get like 16 seconds resolution, which is plenty. Uh, that's what we can do with that. And point that to the actual sample. And then we just ingest those on a regular basis, like at every scrape, telling us to go back and look over at t equals 1. Great. And then at t equals 6, it exposes time stamp equals 2, which is a problem. Because we already ingested a point to a live marker with a timestamp set to 5. And we can't write data back in time because the database is append only. So that's not going to work. Um, so it turns out that with the push gateway, getting the timestamps to work with our semantics, where someone can run a query at any instant, it just doesn't work out. So what we do then, if I'm ingesting something like, like from Federation, where there is a timestamp, how should we integrate that into the staleness handling? And the answer is we ignore it. We just basically say, OK, this sample is opting out of all staleness handling. And none of the new staleness marker applies. So I don't be new staleness logic. No stale markers will be written. And yeah, the short version is don't try to do push or Prometheus. Don't use timestamps unless you know what you're doing. And the other thing is, if there's also another issue, that for many years now, I have been blocking the addition of timestamps to client libraries on the basis that staleness will fix it. And then we'll be able to support it properly and it'll all be grand. However, we now know that staleness won't fix it. And I'm still blocking this feature, which you know a very small number of users need, like four. Um, but the other thing is, though, one of the main abuses we saw is that even though no client library supports this, because I was blocking it, um, <laughs> users were doing it by hand anyway and pushing timestamps in the push gateway, which is the bad, bad idea. And then users learned why it was a bad, bad idea and wanted to set like query staleness delta and that sort of thing. So considering that the reason I didn't want to add it to the client libraries was so people would, wouldn't do this, which wasn't even supported or documented anywhere, I said, right, what we're going to do is the push gateway currently accepts timestamps. As of 040, it doesn't. It will reject any push you make to it with timestamps, so that abuse stops um, because there, we checked there's no valid use cases for it. It was all people trying to do push with Prometheus for non-service level batch jobs. Uh, but to also deal with the use case where you kind of want to aggregate over time and you know, do that sum over time to you know, see, hey, all these batch jobs, how many records did they process in total? There is a new metric automatically now added by the push gateway called push time seconds. So if you do some crazy stuff with recording rules, you can use that to generate the right data. Uh, exactly how you do that is less an exercise to the reader but at least there is a solution there now is possible. So I haven't solved the actual problem as I hoped, but it is resolved now. And yeah, you can add time stuff support client libraries now. So everything so far has been on a largely happy path because we all know that you know, servers never ever crash, especially not Prometheus, especially not you know, 2.0 code that's in alpha and then beta. Never happens. Um, so the question of what happens when Prometheus crashes before the stale markers are written? You know, we could just use the old five-minute logic and fall back to that, but I think we can do a little bit better. Um, because what we could do is look at the last two samples inside that five minutes and presume that's the interval. And then basically, we can say that's the interval, and if, the, if that's more than like four intervals away, plus some safety buffer, then it is stale. So you basically kind of try to guess what the interval is, because like the last two samples should be it, either stale markers or non-stale markers. 
and work from there. And uh, you're asking me, Brian, why four intervals? That seems like a lot of intervals to have to wait to mark something stale. Shouldn't it be like one or two like we have for targets normally? The reason why we have to do this is federation, because we have to consider a worst case. Let's say we're working a system that has 10 second intervals, right? So you're scraping something every 10 seconds and then federating it every 10 seconds. The absolute worst case is as follows. I could start a scrape at t equals 10, and that only gets into Prometheus at t equals 20, which is only pulled by federation at t equals 30 and ingested by federation at t equals 40. And then, well, the next scrape from federation will travel, get in until t equals 50. So it's actually plausible that t equals 50, that a value at t equals 10, in the worst case, where everything is exactly wrongly timed, is in fact the newest value and fresh. So that's why it's four intervals, plus 0.1 for slack. Yeah, it took me a while to realize this was actually a case and why I had to expand it to allow for all these hops. Um, so you might ask about federation, which I briefly mentioned. And federation, there's no special logic here added at all, because federation is fundamentally an instant vector query, which means staleness applies. And federation also exposes timestamps. So the new staleness logic won't apply either, per like six slides ago. The good news is federation is for job aggregated metrics that will remain present. They don't appear and disappear. There's no churn. And so it's basically immune to targets appearing and disappearing. And everyone uses it that way, so that's no problem whatsoever. And any permanent alerts will be on that lower level of Prometheus, so it doesn't apply. So as long as everyone is using federation correctly, you won't notice at all. Yeah. So if you are using federation incorrectly, like by, say, pulling in anything instance level, uh, or pulling entire Prometheus servers through federation, you will not get advantage of new staleness. And you might see some new odd behaviors related to that. So please use federation as it's designed for aggregated uh, metrics that are missing an instance label. Uh, so longer intervals, what can we do about those? So as we've already covered, Prometheus 2.0, you have to basically choose the interval you're looking at. Uh, so for longer intervals, we'd have to ask for more than five minutes of data. Like maybe someone wants to scrape once an hour, so you'd have to ask for an hour of data. That's 12 times more data than we could conceivably have to request for everyone who's doing like the 10 second poll. And that will be very inefficient. So hey, we could reuse that live marker idea we had for timestamps and ingest those every two is minute and point back to the actual thing. So it was just a little slower, but it worked out. But the whole goal of a longer interval normally is to reduce data volume for Prometheus. If we're ingesting these live markers every two minutes, that's not helping. Because, well, that's the same as a two minute interval in terms of TSDB load. It's probably best not to think what that does to compression either, because like that's live NAN looks quite different to the actual data. Um, maybe it's something can be looked at in the future, but you know, increase your interval. We also need to talk about remote read and remote write. So as I said, the TSDB has basically no logic whatsoever related to staleness, which means also remote read and write also needs to have no logic for staleness, which is handy because it's just an opaque value. But we are depending on a special NAN value. Now this is all in protobufs, uh, so that should be preserved correctly through the stack if everyone's doing things correctly, but it does mean that if anyone is doing math, they need to watch out for these NANs. Or maybe they'll just filter, out, filter them out and just rely on the backup logic. Because to be honest, if you're in long-term storage, the NANs and staleness handling probably not quite so important as the active stuff. But it's just something to keep in mind if you're writing a real read-write adapter, you need to pass this stuff, these things on bit for bit. So let's review how this little project worked. A time target goes away, it's time series because they're stale. Yeah, it was a little tricky, it's a little hacky, but it works. Okay, well, it takes an interval too. When a time series, when a target no longer returns a time series, it's stale. Yep, happens on the next scrape, absolutely perfect. If I want to expose timestamps back in time for the push gateway, yeah, sorry, it's never going to happen. But there's other solutions put in place. You know, we've unblocked timestamps from client libraries, there's push time seconds. People can now solve the actual problems they were trying to solve. So that's still a win. And longer valid scrape intervals, well, nothing's improved there, unfortunately. But, you know, just some ideas maybe that might help in future. 
So, you've endured this talk so far. No one seems to have fallen asleep. Just, uh, actually, maybe. Um, <laughs> oh, he's moving now. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, what do you need to do to care about staleness for 2.0? Because, as I said, like, this is the second biggest change in Prometheus 2.0. So the first thing is, if you have hair trigger alerts on absent, you need to add a four clause extended by at least five minutes. If you are fettering using instance level metrics, switch to only aggregator metrics. And uh, otherwise, hey, enjoy the improved semantics and the pretty picture. So in summary, we have a special NAND stale markers. They indicate when it's gone stale. We insert them when targets and time series go away. It doesn't apply to anything with explicit timestamps. And the fallback of 4.1 interface is there, and we still have our five minute look back. It's now in a different claim flag. It's like query dots, some query look back, I think, rather than a stale delta. But that's what it works. But hey, you're thinking, you haven't used up your hour yet. And it's like, no, no, I haven't. I have more for you. If you're still awake, if you still have a will to live, I can do something about that. <laughs> So there's another big change, and this is actually something we've uh, that's already been mentioned at the conference, and that's the isolation feature. Not atomicity, which is my fault for using the wrong name. I was looking the feature to research this. So this is a problem that we believe three users have noticed so far. We already had Cloudflare already mentioning it. Uh, but it's actually quite a big problem that affects everyone. Most people don't realize it, and it's a semantical issue that we need to kind of fix. So what is isolation? The answer is isolation is the I in acid. <laughs> Uh, so, Prometheus 2.0 has the rest. The atomicity is actually slightly debatable if you're using it incorrectly because of how we deal with things out of order. Uh, but what isolation means is if I'm halfway through a scrape and I run a query, I don't see half of that scrape. I just see the previous scrape. So you don't, that's basically what it is, you're talking transactions. So where this is normally causes problems is histograms because it's really important we see those the right way. Um, because we have to see the whole thing at once. But the problem isn't specific to histograms, it's just where users notice it first. It could also happen between any two different time series that you'd want to divide, like a total and a failed. So you can imagine one of them gets the data slightly before the other. Or some weird stuff you can do with rules. So, this is an issue that's been around for a while. I think we've been discussing it for a year and a half, two years maybe. Um, and it gets inflated with other issues like partial scrapes. That's where we're scraping something and it just stops sending stuff. And we don't know that actually it was an interrupted connection rather than something else, which is a different problem we'll solve in a different way. So how do we solve this isolation issue? Well, what we could do is track the oldest scrape that's still happening and ignore all that after that. We'll just note that timestamp and it'll be all be good. So I'm sure everyone here will be perfectly happy with minute old data, two minute old data, due to however long the longest scrape was. And that wouldn't support explicit timestamps, which we kind of need for federation, which kind of comes up with the histograms when you're aggregating them up. Or we could add a watermark per target and rule, and then link each of the time series back to that, and just flip a bit. And this will be the way to solve this in Prometheus 1.0, because it has those internal data structures. But with Prometheus 2.0, the TSDB has no knowledge of targets or rules or anything. It just has the interface the Gutem showed. Just, well, we commit our batches with the appenders, and that's about it. There's no targets. And this also wouldn't help with explicit timestamps. So how could you solve it? Well, the good news with Prometheus 2.0, everything is committed as batches. You notice it's the commission rollback on the appenders. And that's just the primitive we need to build on top of this. So each appender, which is a batch, we do is we have a monothelic 64-bit counter. That is basically the transaction ID. And we basically, when we're writing a sample, we have the timestamp, we have the value, and we have this write ID. For reading, then, we basically track which appenders, which transactions, write transactions are currently in progress. Uh, and we know basically what are the open appends, what's the highest write ID we've given out, and we just snapshot that when doing a read and ignore all the data which is related to an open read or after we started the query. Nice and simple, right? This is one of the ways to do isolation. Uh, so like, this is a classic database problem. This is the approach I took for Prometheus. Yes. Of course, this is a classic database problem, and there's lots written about it, and there's lots written about it for a reason. 
because you want to do this and you want to do it efficiently. And the thing is that none of the storage engines of Prometheus, whether it be 1, v2, or v3, which is, which is 0, 1, none of these were designed with tree values. All they have is, well, a timestamp and a value. They don't have a timestamp and a value and a write ID. And I'm sure that, you know, Fabian would be overjoyed if I suggested to him the tear everything apart just to add this. So I tore it apart a different way. Um, so what we're going to do? Well, the thing is, we could keep it entirely in memory. Because there's a write-ahead log, we don't actually need to persist this stuff after a crash or whatnot, because that's already atomic. So that's fine. Um, and we could also only keep the write-IDs we need. We don't need to keep all of them for the entire life of the Prometheus, because that would be infinite memory. We just need enough to cover, well, what reads are in progress and what writes are in progress. So when I started off doing this, I kept it very simple, and I did something very inefficient. The write-IDs were just a list, which was appended to, and uh, kept forever, which is very inefficient for a number of reasons. Uh, and I also got it all working, which involved lots of API changes internally, because it's all kind of hard-coded and whatnot. Um, there was no separation between the internal and the external API, so I had to kind of break those apart a bit. Um, I wrote a unit test and stress test so I can tell, is this code working? And it's like, yep. After a few days or a week or whatnot, I had this code all working. And working with the stress test. Not hooked up to Prometheus at all, just working with the stress test. And okay, now it's working. Now I need to make it, you know, not suck performance wise. Because you saw those pretty graphs of all the work that Fabian has done improving the performance. He's not going to let me get away with eating all the resources back again. So we need some better data structures than like a list, which is appended to, which would cause amazing amounts of garbage. So to track the open appenders, like these are the transactions, the right transactions in progress, and we just use a map. So when an appender is created, we add the ID to the map. When it's committed to rollback, it's removed from the map. Maybe not the most efficient, but you know, it's what Go provides. It's going to be pretty cheap, and there's a mutex on it. And the right IDs. Well, we need to store the right IDs and associate them with a time series. There is a structure for each series already in the database. It already has like 20, 30 bytes worth of stuff in there. Uh, including like the last four samples for efficiency. Uh, so what we do is use a ring buffer. And ring buffers, or circular buffers, basically just track the start and end, and you just move them along as you go around. And the thing is, the good news is it's constant time to add and remove an element. And if you do need a bigger buffer, because like there's queries in progress holding write IDs in place because you might need them, we just double size the buffer and copy the values over. Fortunately, you have to hand implement this because Go doesn't have generics or any generation or whatnot, and it didn't want to use the interface stuff, uh, so I had to hand code this. But basically, this ring buffer represents the write IDs, these transaction IDs, of the most recent written samples. We also kind of need to clean these up at some point. So you could have a background thread going through all the time series and just deleting the stuff we don't need anymore. Uh, but that could take basically 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour to get through. And considering the block is two hours, that's not particularly useful. Uh, so instead, what I do is like that when we are doing an append, the next append, we pass, by the way, this is the right ID you can clean up until. So we basically are already looking at that uh, time series and we clean it up then. So it's all done in line. It does mean, though, that if a time series you know, if it has right IDs and it's never written to again, those will hang around. Maybe a future optimization, we maybe will add that background thread, but no one's noticed yet. Probably because they only just learned about it. So then there's the queriers. So this is the object which performs queries, because reads and writes are independent with the CSTB. So what we do is we use a doubly linked list for the isolation state. So the isolation state is the snapshot we take of the open appenders and the current write ID. So when I'm running a query, we snapshot these into the isolation state. And the thing is, we keep a doubly linked list of all these isolation states. And the reason we do this is so when I, if it's got this doubly linked list, the oldest one has you know the oldest write ID we need to keep around. And then the other ones, well, they can just remove themselves from this doubly linked list pretty cheaply. It's just updating two pointers. So that's handy. And yeah, when we want to do cleanup and find out this write ID we can remove, it's just the constant time lookup, which is good. So nice and efficient. So after choosing those data structures, what did Prombench say? So I got Prombench working, you know, removed the hard code into uh, CoreOS's DNS name and other things like that. And the answer was it uses about 5% more CPU and 11% more RAM. 
Uh, this is basically the numbers I was expecting. Just doing the math, I expected about 10% RAM increase, so I was right. And my instinct told me it cost 5-ish percent CPU, and it did. So, good gut. Um, and the good news is, though, okay, that's a bit of a hit. But this is still, with all the other improvements, far better than previous 1.0. And I haven't done any micro-optimizations yet. But, you know, this is probably pretty close to, what you can, to optimal already. So we might get that CPU down to 4% or something, or maybe 10% RAM, but I wouldn't expect more than that. But this does show it's pretty handy to choose the right data structures, because all of that came from just choosing the right data structures. So this is not committed yet. Uh, you can see the pull request there. It's been sitting there for a while. I believe there's currently conflicts, because I haven't touched it for a month. Uh, I believe the plan is to incorporate this into Prometheus 2.1, uh, rather than holding back 2.0. Uh, some of the things right now, isolation is only done for a single querier, which in PromQL terms is a single selector. So that means if you do a PromQL expression, different selectors will have different uh, snapshots of the data. That's not great. So this whole isolation thing needs to be exposed all the way up to the TSDB API, just so we can have the same snapshot for the entirety of a single PromQL expression. Uh, and also on the right side, currently, uh, the implementation is that the scrape data and then up and the other scrape stats are done via separate appenders. So we'll want to unify those. So basically that you'll see up at the same snapshot as the ingestion data. That one will be a little trickier to do. The other one is fairly rote. And so to summarize this, we just really don't want to see partial scrapes, partial evaluating or querying them. We basically want to track then which commit all the writes came from. And when we're querying, we ignore samples from writes which are still in progress or after when we start querying. Using the right data structures is really important, like even if they do this to implement them by hand. And this is coming soon to a Prometheus near you, which will make at least Cloudflare happy. Uh, so, got, uh, so just say, well, there's the blog. We've launched training there last week. You can use the code Munich for 10% off. It's like 20% off. And any questions in general? So, questions? So, the back. So regarding timestamps, <laughs> I'm more confused than ever. Uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't use it. Uh, but uh, as far as I remember, the uh, timestamp uh, underscore MES, it's still in the proto model. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about use case when people want to import the historical data using push gateway? You know, they, uh, they always want to append timestamp here. <laughs> Yeah, and they can, and it's now very, very clear from the error message of the push gateway that you can't do that because that was never going to work. So it's okay or not okay? It's not okay, and it's not even theoretically possible anymore because I stopped that working explicitly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the good news is, though, that uh, with the TSDB 2.0, uh, at least the previous 2.0, there's going to be an API for actual batch inserts. It hasn't been implemented yet, but we all agree it should happen. Um, and then that's a proper way to actually ingest these things rather than doing hacks with timestamps. Yeah, I mean, it's a legitimate use case, right? When people want to import the old data and preserve uh, timestamps. So, yeah, so it's something that will happen, but, you know, whenever someone gets around to it. Uh -huh. But it's not going to happen via the push gateway because that's not what the push gateway is for. Aha, uh -huh. okay, great, thanks. Uh, someone there, I think, this next one. Thank you. Uh -huh. It's uh, interesting. Why do you uh, uh, use this uh, very quite quite hacky approach uh, with all these markers and Mantisa bits, and not uh, just add explicitly uh, attributes or flags, maybe? Because you know there are so many libraries that doesn't care about these bits, and for example, protobufs will not restore them if you just. Uh, I would hope that they restore them because it's required by IEEE 754. At least that's what the answer I got when I asked them go like nuts. Like, hey, can I like abuse NANs like this? And someone said, oh yeah, it's totally designed for that. <laughs> it's like, awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so within Prometheus, this all works. It's got unit tests and so on. Uh, the one place to be careful with is remote read and write to make sure you're preserving it in the rest of your system. This should all work perfectly. If it doesn't, we'll just switch all our external APIs to be you win 64 and make it the problem on the other end. 
which we hopefully will not have to do, but that would be an option. In the worst case, if it turns out protobuf isn't, you know, flow 64 clean. So going back to timestamps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for the non-push gateway stuff, should they now work? So for things like uh, the Cloudwork exporter, which is passing through data that happened a little while ago. Yeah, so I haven't implemented it yet, but the plan is, so if you don't know, CloudWatch, it can take up to about 10 minutes for the data to converge, because that's how it works. And considering Prometheus has always been append only, we can't take the unconverged values because we can't fix them. So the approach is we request data 10 minutes ago and ingest it as now because the time stamps are supported by any client library because I was blocking it. So now that that's unblocked, when I get around to adding timestamp support to the Java client, it will be for the purposes of doing that for the CloudWatch exporter. And then it will show you data from 10 minutes ago. And the new scale semantics won't apply because there's no timestamps on it, and you'll have to be careful in graphs and so on. But hey, it'll be the actual timestamp rather than you, you have to remember that it's 10 minutes offset. And there's other places as well. So we've got the, the InfluxDB exporter, select the exporter, and Graphite exporter, which also have timestamps. And there's one or two other cases like that where there is another monitoring system, which is usually push-based or just has timestamps in there. Like even Federation is kind of this case. And that's the case where you want to be using timestamps, just because it's another monitoring system that has timestamps. But that's about all it's really for. Cool. Uh, can you say more about the appropriate use cases for federation, specifically in the cross-service uh, federation case, where you have one Prometheus server that's evaluating alerts that depend maybe on instance-level metrics collected by a second? Uh, so that shouldn't happen. So if you have instance level alerts, like my target is down, you always want to push down your alerts as far down the hierarchy as you can. Because that's fewer points of failure, and it's going to happen faster because you don't have to wait for that extra federation scrape. So if you want to alert on things are down, you're going to do it down at the instance level. Normally when you have cross-service alerts, like, you're put, like you have a database team and you want to just pull their metrics in for graphs or something, or to notice that they're already paged for something or other things like that, Normally, you're not going to be pulling instance-level data. It's going to be a job-level attribute or a cluster-level attribute or something like that. So this doesn't come up. Like, this will still work. It just mightn't have the improved scale semantics. Is it fair to say that instance-level metrics, in all cases, should never be federated? That's not completely true. Uh, sometimes you want to ingest like one or two time series just to know basically where the instances are. So you can imagine if you had a shard set up and you had four shards. And they're basically randomly distributed. No, it's not actually random. And if you want to, from your top-level master, tell which slave has the information, well, if you make it, if you uh, federate up or use remote read or something to tell you, hey, it's this one here, has it, because you've just ingested like the up metric, then you can tie that back and use that in consoles or so on. So there's rare use cases where you do want instance level to come up, but you don't want all the instances, just like one or two metrics. So I think that was the use case Cloudflare has. They were just pulling up up for everything, which I presume they were using for something like that. Thank you. And sometimes it's handy for graphing as well, but you know. So hi, yep. uh, I'm quite surprised at the 11% increase because you're just storing transaction IDs and there's like a whole bunch of, like you're storing actual values and actual samples and why do you think that's 11% and why do you think that's optimal? It doesn't look optimal. Uh, whenever I did the math of just like what's the cost of a time series, what's the cost of this buffer, and the thing is that it's going to be, because the minimum size is four bytes, mm -hmm. sorry, four entries, each of which is eight bytes because it's 64 bits, and then you have your counters as well, two or three ints on top of that. So that comes up to, what's that, 64? You do the math anyway, and look at the size as well of the amount of other data that has to be stored, and it worked out as about 10%-ish was what I was predicting, especially when queries are holding write IDs present, because a query is referencing, you know, if a query takes 30 seconds, it means we need to buffer up 30 seconds worth of write IDs. Now there's other approaches we could take, but when I did the math, the number came out as, look, realistically this is going to take 10% of RAM, and that's what the number came out as with PromRange. So I'm not surprised with the number. If we can improve, that'll be great. So one of the things, uh, as was in your talk, is that we iterate over the series set, like the list of series returning from the posting indexes, uh, and then we get the data from each of them. If we could instead get all those indexes and figure out all the staleness marker stuff, sorry, the isolation stuff, 
and then we wouldn't have to keep all these write IDs around. We'd only need to keep enough for actual writes, which take like a few milliseconds, rather than potentially the whole query. But it now means that we've saved all this RAM on write, but we now cost more RAM on read. So maybe that's a better approach, maybe it's not, and it'd have to be investigated and evaluated. Uh, hi. See, consider that we have a requirement so that uh, a time series is very random in nature. Maybe today we inserted a time series and tomorrow we need to insert the same time series as an example. So uh, in 2.0, uh, we need to insert uh, as in a client or who is producing the matrix to insert this staleness markers or it will work automatically. This is all internal to Prometheus. Okay, so it, it means if, if I'm just giving examples, say today I inserted a metric, uh, sorry, a time series, and uh, tomorrow I will insert one more time series, the same time series, better to say. If I will draw the graph, then I will only get two data points. Uh, yeah, if, you're, if you are using query to get it, you will see those two query points. With That's query what? range, you will probably see two as well, yeah. Ah, yeah, that my, my question is more on uh, range, definitely. Because if I will query for, say, two days data, it will only return two data points. Yeah, if you're using yeah, the query and doing a range vector lookup. Perfect, perfect. So it only returns two data points. Before, yeah. actually, it was returning, currently, it will return maybe 10 data points or some, some more data points. But Well, that's if you're using query and asking for a range vector. If you're using query range and asking for an instant vector, and there's only one data point because you're somehow pushing that into Prometheus, it will still show for five minutes. Because we don't, we, with one data point, we can't infer the interval. So the existing logic of hanging around for five minutes will remain. Even in case of a stale vector, uh, sorry, stale marker? Oh, you said you inserted the data. It depends on exactly, like if it was a scrape, and if Prometheus was running and the target went away, the time series go away, the, the stale marker will be ingested, and it, only that one point will be used. Right. But okay. potentially, if you have a query range with a step smaller than an interval, you are still going to get multiple results. Okay. Right. Because that's how it works. Because it's still stale until that stale marker happens. So if you have a step of one second, you're going to get that 10 times. Because it takes 10 seconds for that stale marker to appear. Uh, can you go back to the to-do slide for the isolation stuff? Yeah. Uh, yes, so yeah, you're not right. happy with some of this? So like this uh, cross-query isolation, um, you said that we just have one query per label selector. Um, we just have one query per query, right? So uh, this should then be skippable. Is it? Does that, does that work with offsets? Yeah, we just like select the entire range that right. fits in. Okay, so range. in that case we can skip that, and if we ever optimize offsets later, we can change it. Yeah. Because otherwise, like the f results would be quite funky. Because at, at least have like per query a series creation isolation already, and otherwise you would get like different series depending on like when the query is actually executed. Okay, yeah, so I, I, I didn't actually look at the code, uh, but yeah, so that means we can skip that. But maybe some optimization will happen in the future because I know uh, remote read does not have that optimization. So it does have that optimization where it'll explicitly ask it. So the offset feature means that sure, I'm asking for an hour ago to two hours ago. But some of that could be offset by a day. So what Fabian's saying is implemented will always ask for 25 hours of data. I presumed it worked the other way. But that means we don't have to worry about this right now until we optimize that later on. The second point we should also do at some point, but it's not as urgent. Hey, um, so there are a couple of times in the stillness oh. uh, there are a couple of times in stillness a uh, bit where it would have been useful for you to be able to write in the past. Would it not be possible for TSDB to support uh, bounded writes into the past if it would, say, keep two chunks in memory before persisting them to disk? It already keeps two blocks in memory before persisting to disk. So can the thing you is, not... it's the compression is part of it, because we'd have to go back and redo all the compression for that. Uh, OK, cool. Yeah, Thanks. it's just generally you can make that work. We've basically just decided not to. Um, it's usually not a problem. Like, it only comes up in places like remote write on the other end, where it's like, can we have that in order, please? Because then you'd ha normally have to start a new chunk, merge those two chunks together. Uh, yeah, so it's not a problem with Prometheus, it comes up more elsewhere. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thanks for taking us on that wild ride. I have to admit I only understand 50% of all that, but it's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.